New Scientist Discovery Tours has just launched a new trip and guess where it's to? Hmm, I don't know, tell me. The Galapagos Islands. This tour is called Darwin's Galapagos and it's with marine biologist and film producer Joe Ruxton, MBE. Uh, You tour the central and southern Galapagos Islands aboard a small luxury yacht. Full details at newscientist.com slash tours. Hello and welcome to New Scientist Weekly. This is the show that brings you a curated selection of the essential science stories of the week. Our aim is to feed your curiosity. I'm your host, Penny Sarche. And I'm Rowan Hooper. Welcome to the show. This week, we're joined by New Scientist journalists Leah Crane, Madeleine Cuff and Michael LePage. Hello, all. Hi. Hi. Coming up on the show this week, we've got news that we may soon breach 1.5 degrees of warming above pre-industrial levels. And then in not at all awkward a gear change, we've got an interview with someone who insists we shouldn't worry about eating less meat or flying. And uh, he reveals the real things we should be angry about when it comes to tackling climate change. We'll also be hearing about the first view we've had into the permanently shadowed regions of the moon and also why half of the galaxy's mass has gone missing. All that Mm. and mushrooms. But first, Michael, this week you reported on a study claiming ultrasound might have anti-aging effects, which um, sounds sort of too good to be true, but quite exciting. Tell us all about it. Yeah, so this is a team in the US who uh, have discovered that low frequency ultrasound seems to rejuvenate senescent cells growing in the lab. And they've also done tests on mice and it seems to have beneficial effects on them as well. So uh, remind us what senescent cells are. They sound bad. Yeah, so the cells in our bodies can only divide a certain number of times and eventually they grind to a halt and stop dividing. This is known as the Hayflick limit and cells that have stopped dividing are called senescent. And what's more, senescent cells secrete things that make other cells around them become senescent too. So there's one study where they just implanted a few senescent cells into the knees of young mice and these mice uh, developed an osteoarthritic-like condition. So basically, as we get older, more and more of the cells in our body become senescent. And this is thought to be one of the main causes of ageing related diseases. So the ultrasound somehow reverses this senescence? Well, that's what this team is claiming. So, for instance, human foreskin cells normally become senescent after about 15 cell divisions. But when this team treated them with a low frequency ultrasound, they were still going strong after 24 cell divisions. Michael, I thought um, foreskin cells was rather a specific tissue type to use it as an example there but is that because you know there's lots of spare foreskins lying around because of circumcision it's it's exactly that so they've been a favorite (laughs) tissue of researchers for a long time yeah Mm. so we know a lot about that yeah Um, (laughs) perhaps more than we need to Um, (laughs) Um, so stepping aside from that um, can you explain to us what exactly uh, low frequency ultrasound is Yeah, so ultrasound simply means sound that's at too high frequency for us to hear. So the upper limit of our hearing is around 20 hertz. The ultrasound that would be used in a medical scan, for instance, in pregnancies, would be much higher than this, around 2000 hertz. What this team is using is sort of closer to what we can hear. It's below 100 hertz, so well below the levels usually used for scanning. So as well as looking at this uh, discarded human tissue, um, Mm. you you said they saw benefits in mice too. That's right. So they took these old mice, which means mice are around 22, 25 months old. They put them in water so that at least half their bodies were covered. And then they used that water to transmit the ultrasound into their bodies. And they gave them half hour treatments and saw physical improvements such as better running on treadmills. (laughs) <laughs> and the researcher, Michael Sheets, he told me that in some cases, the improvements were actually really dramatic. So they said there was one mouse that was looking really old and had a hunched back and wasn't moving very well at all. But apparently, after getting the ultrasound treatment, it was pretty much back to behaving normally in physical terms. And then afterwards, the team also looked at the kidneys of some of the mice, and they found that the proportion of senescent cells in the mice that had been treated was lower than, than the other ones. So try not to get too excited because this is just one study. So obviously it needs confirming and (laughs) expanding beyond mice and and human foreskins. But um, assuming it really does work, do do we have any idea why ultrasound would have this kind of an effect? No, in fact, Sheets himself described it as mystifying. But (laughs) his, his sort of hypothesis is actually that it's mimicking exercise. 
So if you think about it, exercise obviously has physical effects on the cells in our bodies and, and ultrasound does too. So it might be working in the same kind of way. And of course, exercise is the best anti-aging medicine that we know about and has all kinds of beneficial effects. I mean, it's not like other anti-aging medicine you sometimes hear about, which um, will probably be really expensive because some drug companies developed it. If this worked, it would be effectively free, wouldn't it? Because it's ultrasound. It's just cheap. Well, you're going to have to you're going to have to deliver it. But yeah, so I mean, this is obviously the big question. Will it work in people too? Mm. Uh, and the team's actually already planning to start a small trial within a couple of months, uh, which will involve people with osteoarthritis. So they're, they're basically going to stick them in a bath and give them ultrasound in a similar way as they, they did with the mice. Mm. Uh, and the main aim is to see if it's safe, but also obviously they'll be looking to see if it's beneficial. I, I think it's important to say it's possible that even if it's confirmed to work in mice, it might not work in people because our bodies are so much bigger and it's much harder for ultrasound to penetrate deep inside our bodies. You know, our bones and our lungs actually block ultrasound. And then, of course, it's also important to say ultrasound therapy is actually nothing new at all. People have been using it for decades to treat all kinds of disorders from osteoarthritis, as we mentioned earlier, to erectile dysfunction, believe it or not. But the thing is, most of those studies have involved high-frequency ultrasound, typically delivered by handheld devices, similar to scanners. And so it's not the same as the approach used by the US team. So we're going to have to do uh, a lot of studies to sort of confirm these results and see if they really do have sort of the same benefits in, in people. Now, Leia, I'm really looking forward to talking to you about Shackleton Crater on the south pole of the moon. I mean, that's the that's the best address on the moon to have, isn't it? It's where people are going to live. And NASA call it, what, a permanently shadowed region, a PSR, which is a very unromantic name for uh, <laughs> somewhere where you might live on the moon. But um, this is an area on the moon that sunlight never reaches. And, and so that's why they're interesting, aren't they? Yeah, so we probably wouldn't live in the permanently shadowed region um, <laughs> for the same reasons why it's really interesting. These areas sort of on the sides of craters where they never, ever get direct sunlight. So they're super cold. They're dark all the time. And that means that these are also areas where there might be ice or frost on the surface. Yeah. We, if we're going to spend any amount of time on the moon, we want to find water there that we can use. So this could be the easiest source of water on the moon. Yeah. That's great. But a permanently shadowed region is also really hard to look into because it's super dark. So now we have this instrument that's way better at looking into these regions than anything else we've had before. It's called Shadow Cam. It's a cool name. I'll give them that. <laughs> <laughs> it uh, is so what did name. Shadow Cam see? What, it, what have we got from it? Well, so it just sent back its first picture of a region about 2,000 meters wide inside Shackleton Crater. And the first image didn't really reveal any surprises. It just revealed that the camera is working great. But it did show us that eventually we will be able to look for water inside these regions using just the small amount of sunlight that bounces off everything around into them, not direct sunlight. Have they used radar before to look into these layer to sort of what have they done before to sort of see if water ice is present in these places? Yeah, so previous observations with less good cameras, with radar, with all sorts of other stuff, has shown that we think there probably is ice there. We don't have sort of definitive, here's a picture of ice there yet. And we still don't. The area of Shackleton Crater in this image is pretty warm compared to other permanently shadowed regions, which means that it's above minus 163 degrees Celsius, which is the temperature that's required to keep ice stable on the lunar surface. So it's still not warm. But it's like it's... my kitchen at the moment is about that temperature, <laughs> I think. Yeah, it's relatively warm, but it's still pretty cold. You wouldn't want to hang out there. And you really wouldn't want to hang out in other permanently shadowed regions because they're pretty much all even colder. So those could have ice in them. Very cool. Oh, I didn't mean to say very cool. <laughs> very cool. <laughs> Leia, while you're here, um, what about this story about the Milky Way just losing half of its matter? That, that seems very irresponsible of it. <laughs> <laughs> well, so we have pretty good measurements of the total mass of the Milky Way. But some measurements of radio waves passing through the galaxy have shown that its proportion of visible matter as opposed to dark matter is 40% lower than the rest of the universe. <laughs> so we don't have a lot of regular matter here. <laughs> 
Where's it all bloody gone? <laughs> well, we think that it probably was chucked out early in the evolution of the galaxy. We know that supernovas and really massive stars can blow matter out of galaxies as they form. And so can the supermassive black holes at the centers of galaxies. So we already kind of thought from simulations that this might have happened. But this is just another piece of evidence that probably we chucked out a bunch of regular matter pretty early in the galaxy's development. So when the galaxy was a baby, it threw its toys out the pram. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Love it. Save 50% on an annual digital subscription in our January sale and let science guide you on your journey forward. Become a New Scientist digital subscriber and you'll receive unlimited access to over 50 new articles a week on newscientist.com, unrestricted access to the New Scientist app, including our Essential Guide series, free online events brought to you by world-class scientists and experts, our weekly Editor's Highlights newsletter exclusive to subscribers, and access to free accredited courses from New Scientist Academy. You can get all of that for just £2.25 a week in the UK or $1.92 a week in the US. Go to newscientist.com to grab this bargain. We're back. And Maddie, you've been reporting on a story about the much discussed 1.5 degrees threshold of warming. So that's the limit that the Paris Accord says that we should really aim to restrict global heating to. And when we say 1.5 degrees, we, we mean the amount of warming above the pre-industrial average. And basically, we should do everything we can not to get there. So where are we now? So the Met Office at the moment thinks that we have already warmed the atmosphere by about 1.2 degrees above pre-industrial levels. And it is warning that we could get bumped beyond that 1.5 degree threshold by a strong El Nino. So El Nino and La Nina are terms used to describe basically fluctuations in the Earth's climate system, which are driven by changing sea surface temperatures in the equatorial Pacific. So really broadly, El Nino is a warming of the Pacific Ocean and La Nina is a cooling force. And we kind of cycle in and out of El Nino and La Nina's every few years. We've been in a La Nina for the last three years, but there are warnings coming that an El Nino is on the horizon. Um, Maddie, isn't it kind of really scary that we've been in a kind of cooling period during the last three years. And that's when we've seen all these record heat waves and really horrendous weather events, extreme weather events, floods and droughts around the world. Yeah, to be honest, speak to a climate scientist and they'll tell you that that is pretty terrifying. Mm. I mean, last year's bleaching event on the Great Barrier Reef, it was the first time ever that bleaching has happened on the reef under La Nina. So yeah. it kind of just goes to show how much we're changing the atmosphere as it is without the impacts of El Nino and La Nina added onto that. And so, as I mentioned, the latest climate model suggests that we are likely to tip into El Nino by the end of this year, which will have an impact on global temperatures. So El Ninos vary in strength. The rule of thumb is that roughly every for every one degree C of El Nino translates into about 0.1 degrees C increase in global temperatures. So you need a tiny bit of maths to add all this up, but bear with me. A strong three degrees of El Nino would push up global average temperatures by about 0.3 degrees Celsius by 2024. So if you add that 0.3 degrees to the 1.2 degrees of warming that we've already experienced since the Industrial Revolution, then you get over that 1.5 degree threshold. So the headline is that 2024 could be the first year where we see warming beyond 1.5 degrees. When you said we had to do some maths, I was steeled myself, but it was only to <laughs> add 0.3 to 1.2, which I could cope with. Um, I, OK, look, this is not good news, but what's perhaps even worse is is a, a sudden jump in temperature. If we get this, you know, 0.3 in, in a very short space of time is not going to be good, is it? Yeah, so generally El Ninos bring some pretty unwanted consequences anyway. And if you add a strong El Nino on top of the background rate of warming, which is increasing every year, then we probably would see some pretty severe consequences. So things like bleaching of coral reefs, disruption to monsoon seasons in Indonesia and India, wildfires and severe drought in Australia, those are all the types of impacts that we could see under a strong El Nino. And I was having a chat with Terry Hughes, who's a leading coral reef professor in Australia, and he told me that the prospect of a strong El Nino next year was terrifying. 
Hmm. But we shouldn't panic just yet. It's really <laughs> early in the year to be predicting El Ninos, let alone saying what strength they might be. Hmm. Um, and scientists will have a much better idea later in the year whether we're going to have a really strong El Nino or not. Okay, we won't panic quite yet. But I mean, the 1.5 degree has attained this kind of hallowed status, hasn't it? It's going to be a big deal if we go past it. It would be an absolutely huge milestone. I mean, it, it would kind of cause political uproar. Um, and <laughs> I think it would really prompt some serious questions about whether the world is taking this challenge seriously. But mm. I, it is important to stress that even if we did pass 1.5 degrees of warming for a single year, that increase would probably be temporary. And for the 1.5 degree target that's enshrined in the Paris Agreement to be officially breached, scientists would be looking for warming above that level for, for years and years on end. So they're looking for a warming trend above 1.5 rather than kind of a single year of, of really hot temperatures. But I mean, it does underscore how close we are getting to 1.5 degrees. And, and because it's such a kind of cornerstone of climate action, it does beg the question, what do we do when that limit is breached? And how do we kind of continue to galvanize that sense of urgency and push for greater climate action if it looks like we've failed at the first hurdle? Next up, it's life form of the week. Uh, Penny, mushrooms. Yeah, that's right. And not just any mm. mushrooms, oyster mushrooms, which are quite trendy at the moment if you're into your plant-based cuisine. Plant-based cuisine? Yes. Yeah, so, of course, mushrooms aren't actually plants. Uh, they're the fruiting bodies of fungi that live underground or in deadwood or, or similar. So what about oyster mushrooms um, other than being yummy? <laughs> well, so apparently we've known since the 1980s that this species, uh, well, the species that produces oyster mushrooms, Pleurotus ostriatus, eats nematodes, which are tiny microscopic roundworms um, that live on our planet in, in vast numbers. But we didn't know how the fungus did it. I, you say we've known since the 80s. I didn't know that, that no, me, mushrooms me. eat nematodes. I didn't. I did not know this either, which is why Whoa. why this is such a cool story. Yeah. Um, and so, so yeah, this is a new study that that looks at how the species that produces oyster mushrooms manages to do that, and it does it in a really uh, gruesome but cool way. So, what they do is they develop these tiny lollipop shaped little structures that break open when a nematode's head happens to press against it. And <laughs> when, yeah, you know, as you do in, in when it crawling along in a log. And once these open up, they release what is basically a nerve gas that turns out to be highly toxic for nematode worms. Wow, those dastardly mushrooms. Uh, that's really quite amazing, isn't it? Yeah, and it's all happening at this microscopic scale. And, and these tiny structures, they grow on the fungus's hyphae, which is this, this sort of the network of filaments that this fungi lives as all year round. You know, we yeah. often just think of mushrooms, but this is what the fungus is the rest of the time. And so they're basically, they're microdosing the nematode with a tiny bit of this nerve gas. And what's the gas? It's called 3-octanone. And when the team behind this study tested it in the lab, uh, they found it caused multiple nematode species to have a sudden influx of calcium ions into their nerve and muscle cells. And that basically just messes with all the functions. And it led quickly to paralysis and death for these species. <laughs> oh, what a horror show underground here. Um, so what's happening next? Like... You know, when we pick the mushrooms, are they are there those dead worms in there then that we're eating? No. So um, these hyphae, the filaments of, of the of the fungus, um, they then sort of move in and digest the insides of the worm and absorb it. And the thinking is that well, the reason they probably evolved to do this is that rotting wood, which they grow in, is very low in nitrogen. But if you want to make proteins, you need nitrogen. So it's very possible that that's the appeal. They go in, they take the they digest the insides of the worm so that they can have nitrogen and can then produce all the lovely, delicious proteins that we like to enjoy. Mm. And it turns out, you know, like you, I didn't know this was a thing, but it turns out that there are other fungal species that also prey on nematodes using a variety of other ingenious methods. Um, and you can read all about those in Alice Klein's story on this. We'll post a link to that in our show notes. Um, it's also got pictures of these really special little nerve gas lollipops if you want to see them. Yeah, nerve gas lollipop is a weird juxtaposition of words, <laughs> Yeah, things, isn't it? things I thought I'd never say, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but does this mean that oyster mushrooms are effectively carnivorous? 
Yeah, I guess technically. And so uh, I was sort of interested to read in Alice's article that there has been some speculation about whether this means oyster mushrooms can truly be considered vegan. But I think I think that's a bit of a fine distinction. If we start sort mm. of thinking about all the microscopic little worms that get harmed in food production, maybe nothing would count as truly purely vegan. Now, we heard from Maddie earlier about this 1.5 degree of warming and the consequences of of breaching that. And we talk all the time about what we need to do to tackle climate change and how to go about reducing emissions. And we worry about things like eating meat and flying in particular. Some people worry about, you know, even having children. But I've been talking to someone who says we don't need to worry about any of that stuff at all. Asad Razouk is an entrepreneur based in Singapore and he runs a clean energy business and he's just published a book called Saving the Planet Without the Bullshit, What They Don't Tell You About the Climate Crisis. And I asked him first about why he thinks veganuary is a distraction. I have all the respect in the world for individual choice. You should absolutely go vegan if that's what you think you should do. And perhaps you are making a difference. However, we should be aware at the same time that I would say the the overwhelming majority of people around the world aren't going to go vegan. The global south is actually looking forward to eating more meat because it's a status symbol. And we often, I think, forget about the rest of the world in some of these debates. However, when you build in the rest of the world, Right, You build a perspective that says, okay, I've gone vegan, so I've done something. I would like that very same person to then think, I understand this may not be huge in terms of an impact. Now, what do I do that could be huge? And on the subject of veganism in particular, I can tell you that protesting, for example, for the European Union to pass, which it did, laws that make directors individually responsible for deforestation in the supply chain of the products that they're selling us is vastly more powerful. That is one law with an amazing global impact that you're going to see play out over the next few years. And it just passed. We're talking two months ago. So that is something that comes through in your book is that it's big companies, big tech, big agriculture, and and most of all, big oil that are the real problems and that they, they are the ones that are really responsible for the mess that we're in. Yes. So fly less, sure, but at the same time, protest for the big levers to change. Go vegan, sure, but at the same time, join an NGO or support an NGO or people that are launching lawsuits, for example, against big polluters. It is very clear where the responsibility for where we are sits and why we need to focus our efforts so that those responsible don't get away with it. Let's dig into flying a bit more, though. Can you you know, explain to people why we shouldn't feel guilty about flying? Well, there has been a documented 40-year rear guard campaign not to invest in decarbonizing flight. And this continues to this day. Meanwhile, the guilt feeling, so to speak, has been pushed away from those who manufacture planes, those who operate planes, and those who regulate them and tax them, down to me, the consumer who's supposed to fly shame you, my friend and or family member or customer. And I think that's completely crazy for two reasons. Number one, once again, the responsibility sits very clearly somewhere where people are not affected by you flying less. And then the fact that flying more is once again an overwhelming feature in the rest of the world, because it doesn't just matter what we think in Sweden or Denmark or in the UK. Of course it matters, but we need to then judge what we're doing in context. And, you know, the the numbers 
don't lie, right? If every single Swede, say, stopped flying, it's not going to make a difference to the growth of air travel. So we need to go fight the problem where it sits. And I take a lot of comfort from the fact that since the Paris Agreement, there's been over 100 new electric startups in aviation. And that is what we need. One thing I like about your Twitter feed is that there's uh, there's this good climate news thread that you post each week. Uh, It's like a roundup of all the really encouraging things that are happening. What's something that's giving you hope at the moment? I'm actually very confidently optimistic because I can see what's bubbling under the surface in terms of renewable energy deployment, in terms of fighting back against deforestation. I can also see the tens of millions of people who care tremendously and are trying to do something about it. So I'm actually quite confident that between now and 2030, we will have a lot more good climate news each week and that there will come a point when they will actually also accelerate. That was Assad Razouk talking about his book, Saving the Planet Without the Bullshit, What They Don't Tell You About the Climate Crisis. And it's well worth a read. And we've got a longer version of that interview going up in a few days. So do look out for that. We talk more about the role of legal challenges in tackling climate change. And we talk about why we don't need to worry about the, say, like the energy costs of mining Bitcoin. And there's more on his his confident optimism for the future. That's all for this week. Thanks to our guests, Michael LePage, Madeline Clough and Leah Crane. And thanks to you for listening. Do subscribe to this show and tell all your friends about it. And we'll see you next week. Bye for now. Bye. 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 (laughs) Brilliant timing. This podcast is produced by OG Podcasts. Find out more at ogpodcasts.co.uk.